Let's read together Psalm 71, verses 15 and 16. I will tell everyone about your righteousness. All day long I will proclaim your saving power. Though I am not skilled with words, I will praise your mighty deeds, O sovereign Lord. I will tell everyone that you alone are just. Good morning, family. What a beautiful day. The day that we have an opportunity to worship our Lord. The day that we get to gather together in his name. I know I've been saying this every week, but it just is, I mean, just so all oh, the fact that we, mere humans, have been given permission to worship the one true God the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And not only that, but to get to know him on a personal level. How blessed we are. Let's go to him in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for the love that you pour into our lives. Thank you for making us new creations. Thank you for uh, bringing us, adopting us into your family. Father, as we gather this morning, May we be able to open our hearts to lay them out before you. See that our love and our desire is for you and you alone. Father, I know we have a lot of distractions in this world. Help us to lay them aside this morning and focus our hearts, our lives on you. Father, we worship you. We thank you. We praise you. In your sense, holy and precious name we pray. Amen. A couple of announcements before we get on. We just a quick reminder of our diaper drive. It's only got a couple more weeks. We've got quite a, a few boxes of diapers that are in wipes that are able to take down to the Caring for Women Pregnancy Resource Center. If you uh, haven't been able to, if you still want to add some more, you still have some time, we won't be taking them down until the end of the month. Our family night, we forgot to announce it earlier, but it is this Friday at 6.30 p.m. We'll be gathering here for some kind of family-related activity of some kind to be a bit of a surprise for us, but it's a great time of fellowship and time to encourage each other. Coming up in one week is Father's Day. To honor our dads this year, we're asking for you to bring your favorite picture of your father to share with us. We're going to be hanging the pictures on the board in the side room so all can see about the men who influenced your lives. And also next week we're having our Father's Day potluck after church. So we look forward to that as we honor our dads in a very wonderful way. We also have a couple of anniversaries this week. Tony and Kathy Gilman, my mom and stepdad, their anniversary is today. Happy anniversary, Mom, Tony. And also on Wednesday is Ivan and Shauna's uh, anniversary. It's a happy anniversary too. And we have this song for you just to honor you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary to you. Another year's gone by Oh, how time does fly For the day you said I do We raise this toast to you
morning, church. This morning, I'd like to share with you Psalms 51, 10, 12, and 13. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors transgressors your way and sinners will be converted to you. When I got saved, people were shocked. I had been a pretty wild partier and they saw the change that only God could bring. He changed my heart, my attitude, my desires and direction. When people, when people see a drastic change in us, it makes God real. They see the power of God in us, and they desire the same change in their lives. We are free will agents. We have to desire to change. We have to want a touch of God in our lives. Sometimes we have to be disgusted with our lifestyles. We have to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. We have to be tired of the dirt and the mire of sin. We have to desire clean hearts. It starts with salvation and giving your heart to Jesus. Then in your daily walk, you can stay clean by staying close to Jesus. Sometimes life can bounce you off course. A steadfast spirit is a consistent walk. So stay on course, follow God's will, and receive the promise of joy. We are happy, content, at peace when we are in Jesus. We are examples to a lost and dying world when we are in a right relationship with him. As a result, our examples of righteous living compel others to follow Jesus. Lord, clean me, fill me, use me, help me to stay on track, give my strength, wisdom, and good favor to see others converted to you. Amen. Uh, Would you repeat the good confession with me? I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God.
Good morning, church. Be blessed today. Uh, we are uh, holding 2 Corinthians 8 as our uh, different times, different parts of uh, the scripture there uh, for devotionals, for, for uh, our tithes and offerings. Uh, today, uh, we're going to run three or four verses Starting with verse 6. But let me say this. Generosity is a gift of grace from God. But also, uh, it's an exercise of the heart and the soul. We see that from verse 1 to 3, we have information and a teaching. Uh, from verses 4 and 5, we have the practicality of uh, what we have learned. And now we're going to start with verse uh, 6. And <clears throat> verse 6 reads like this. So we urge Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. Um, here we have more um, of the act of grace, generosity, encouraged. <clears throat> the first thing we notice here is that we ch uh, Paul is saying that he's challenging Titus to finish the lessons he started. Some time ago. Uh, I'm going to read verse 7. But just as you uh, excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in uh, complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Um, so we have here the list of uh, uh, this uh, thing we call uh, giving or uh, generosity. Um, then we, uh, oh, here, here is the list of ex uh, excelling in the gift. Faith. Speech, knowledge, complete earnestness, and in your love for us. These are uh, remarkable good. But there is one that the Apostle Paul challenges them uh, not to forget about it. And it's the grace of giving in their ge generosity. Once in a while, it's good to be reminded of this gift of grace, generosity towards uh, others. It, it is good to be reminded. Generosity uh, that Paul's recommend for us to do. Verse 8. I am not commending you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. So not a command, just a test. Life is a test, a big old test, in comparing with others. The fastness of your reaction when asked or request financial help for other uh, believing Christians. How fast we react to that. Verse 9, for you, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become 
rich. And Paul is not talking about money, uh, but rather he's talking about uh, the life of the Lord Jesus in heaven uh, has no comparison to coming to earth. And he is rich in spirituality. He is rich in um, relational and relationship with the Father. And so Paul is talking about, again, the richness of Jesus' spiritual life. Because one day somebody asked him, where do you live? And he says, I don't have a house. I don't have a pillow. I don't know things like that. And so, what can we say to this? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for teaching us to be generous to others, as others have been generous in, in their giving to us. Father, thank you for what your word has for us, what it has to say about um, stepping up when the time comes and our help is re required or our help is requested. Uh, just be with us. Help us to do it from the heart and not just from the uh, focus of attention. Help us to do it from the heart. Uh, thank you for the best example ever, our Lord Jesus, in whose name we praise Pray, amen. As we come to our time of prayers and praises. We have some praises to share. Wednesday, June shared with me that she has a new great-granddaughter, her son Alan Brown's uh, daughter. Uh, one of her da his daughters has had a baby this last week. I forgot to write the name down, but we can get that to you. And also, Doug has been having some difficulty with his sciatic this last few weeks, and he's been doing a lot better for that. The doctor's been providing some stuff for him that's been helping out with that. Also in some of our prayers, as some of you heard, Sharon Loftmiller spent some time in Inlow. As of Friday, she was still there. Um, I don't know if she's back by Sunday morning, but she was having some difficult breathing, breathing and so uh, she went up to Inlow and she found out that she is anemic and they've been giving her a couple of blood transfusions and to plan and do some other things to help find out what their difficulties are. So keep sharing in your prayers. And also Damien McKerzek, Mickey's husband, spent a couple days at Inlow uh, for tests, and they're waiting for results right now, so keep them in prayer. Also keep Bruce Hughes in prayer. Uh, he is in Oregon right now, if I remember correctly, and he'll be returning on Monday morning. So we look forward to him to being back with us. My wife, Lynn, is traveling to visit friends in Virginia on Tuesday, so keep her in your prayers and also me so I stay out of trouble while she's gone. Also, our Heavenly Hills Christian Camp, uh, their, their junior camp starts today. Uh, it goes on until Saturday, and next week on Sunday evening, uh, the teen camp is starting, so keep this week and next week especially, keep the staff and the kids in your prayers throughout this week that the Lord will truly move in the lives of these young people. And also continue keeping Bonnie in prayer as the kids' music camp is coming up in just a little over a month. And so uh, she's scrambling to get things ready, uh, getting things lined up, and uh, making connections with kids. So keep her in your prayer, those that are helping her, her staff, and of course the kids and their families. Uh, that, the, that the message of the, of the uh, musical that the kids do will truly reach and touch lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this opportunity you've given us to worship you. 
Father, you, in changing our lives, given us the very permission to enter your throne room and lay before you that which is on our hearts. Father, we lift up to you uh, June Brown's uh, new great-granddaughter and her, in the family, Father, just, I just pray that you'll bless them and just help them to truly raise this young girl, child up into your, into your love. Thank you for being with Doug and with the struggles he's been having physically and, and give him relief from his sciatic. Father, just continue being and working in his lives. Father, we lift up to you, Sharon and Damien, who spent some time in the hospital, and I think Sharon may still be there. And Father, continue being with the doctors. They work with them, finding out the results of tests. Father, just pray that um, their health will get better and in your word, your life will move in their lives. Father, for those in our church family traveling, Bruce, who will be traveling back from Oregon um, tomorrow, and also Lynn, who's going to be heading out to Virginia on Tuesday. Father, keep them safe as they travel until they return. Father, be with those that working with Heavenly Hills Christian Camp these next couple of weeks with the kids that are coming. Work in the lives of the staff. Work in the lives of the kids that their lives may be changed, lifted up, encouraged because of your son. And Father, also be with Bonnie and her staff as they get ready for the music camp coming up in July. Father, begin preparing the hearts of the kids and the families. Father, we look forward to work, you seeing you work through these young people and working into the lives of these young people. And Father, we thank you for this uh, beautiful Sunday. I thank you for the opportunity to share from your word. Father, allow my words that I share speak true. Father, allow me and my personality to step back so you may receive all glory, honor, and praise. Father, we thank you and we praise you in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Tomorrow is June 14th, Flag Day. Many Americans celebrate Flag Day by flying the flag in front of their homes and businesses. It's the day we commemorate the adoption of the Stars and Stripes as the official flag of the United States of America. The idea of an annual Flag Day was first suggested by a small town teacher but in Wisconsin by the name of Bernard Sigrad in 1885. But it wasn't until 1916 that President Woodrow Wilson officially established June 14th as Flag Day. What's interesting about Flag Day is that it is not an official federal holiday. It is just a nationwide observance day. But there is one state that has made it an official holiday, and that's the state of Pennsylvania. The flag symbolizes the bond that unites many of us, especially those in the military. While the flag of the United States of America is, is seen by some, unfortunately, as something to separate us, by those who wear the uniform of a U.S. soldier, Marine, sailor, it's something that unites us. We're continuing our sermon series on a Christian is. We're looking at the different words and phrases that the Bible, God's word, uses to describe us. So far, we've looked at brother, sister. We've looked at disciple, friend. Last week, we looked at alien and stranger. And today, we're looking at a Christian is a soldier. We're going to be doing this first, we're going to take a really, uh, we're going to take a look at Paul's second letter of Timothy, and we're going to do that by taking a fast survey of 2 Timothy. I've listed the scriptures and the text, but I want us to get a big picture. Uh, I want us to be able to um, imagine being a soldier of Jesus Christ. You see, it was in that letter, 
Paul's second letter to Timothy that the idea of us being a soldier was introduced. And by taking a fast survey of this book, this letter, we will be able to get the big picture of what was in Paul's mind when he used that description. You see, first of all, 2 Timothy was Paul's last letter that he wrote in the New Testament. It was probably the last letter that he wrote at all. While Peter was crucified in Rome for his faith, Paul was most likely in Spain. And when Paul returned to Rome, he was imprisoned. And this imprisonment was not like the house arrest and chains of his early imprisonment, at which the time that he wrote the prison epistles of of Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. This time, Paul is in solitary confinement. And he's waiting execution by beheading. This letter by Paul is to his son in the faith, and it is a very personal letter. It's full of promise. Paul uses the words remember or remembrance alongside the phrase not ashamed to help us outline the chapters. Chapter 1, unashamed memories. Chapter 2, unashamed ministry. Chapter 3, unashamed warnings. And chapter 4, unashamed charges. Paul is writing what many call his last will and testament. And in this letter he charges Timothy and every Christian, you and I, to give our all to the mission of the gospel. So here we go. Paul writes this letter to his partner in ministry, Timothy. And right at the very beginning, he calls Timothy, my dear son. And he charges Timothy to to do the work. I didn't put that in. To do the work of the evangelist. That's in chapter 4, verse 5. The gospel must be told. Many actions might consume our days and hours, but good works without telling of the greatest story ever told will not leave behind believers in Christ, will not leave behind Christian congregations. For many years, Timothy was Paul's helper, and now he must become Paul's voice. Paul wants him to fan the flame, the, fi- on, wants him to be on fire, to fan the flame of the gift that God had given him, given Timothy when he had laid his hands upon him. Paul's son in the gospel needs to overcome Timothy and not to be ashamed to testify about our Lord. The hour has come to join in the suffering in the gospel because it was this gospel that Paul was suffering. Especially now, Timothy must grow up. He must be ready to guard the good deposit that was entrusted in him, which he is fully equipped to do with the help of the Holy Spirit. The teachings that Paul entrusted him, he must now entrust them to a reliable man who will also be qualified to teach others. If Paul's life can be taken away, so can the lives of his co-workers. And since the voice of each worker is stopped at death, the multiplication of workers is God's way of keeping that going. Each worker has the mission to recruit converts, but also raise up future workers. The only qualification for them is that they be reliable and qualified. Each congregation is wise to count not only how many ministers have served in their church, but also how many Timothys have walked out of the church, how many workers for the church have been raised up to serve across the world. See, Paul's purpose is that the message might be fully proclaimed and that all the Gentiles might hear it. He reminds those who will continue the work, Timothy and us, that you know all about my purpose and that to per- fulfill that purpose, he must do a, to do uh, to fulfill that purpose, he must do his best to be a workman who correctly handles the word of truth, and he will preach the word in season and out of season. 
And what he will not do, as we read earlier, is get involved in civilian affairs if he wants to please his commanding officer. The great command of Christ, the commanding officer, focuses the army of believers on its high command of soul winning. The most damaging of Satan's devices is to get the church off course, is to offer roads that appear so right that all efforts and energies are lacking, leaving little time or place for sharing about Christ's gift of salvation for evangelism. Paul tells us to stick to the compass of God's word. To stick to the compass of the Holy Spirit, Holy Scriptures. The Scriptures would guide man to obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. We need to major in Scripture and that the man of God will be thoroughly equipped. For if we minor in the minors, the battle for souls is lost. Now that that quick, and I know it was really quick, overview uh, is in our minds, let's go back to that image of a soldier. A Christian is a soldier in the Lord's army. That means we are soldiers in the Lord's army. As we read earlier, 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Paul Tensky wrote, Those of us who serve in the armed forces can understand what Paul said about seeking to please our commanding officer. I'm not certain I always did what I was supposed to do because I wanted to please the officers who gave me orders. I do know, however, I made sure to do what I was commanded, to, commanded and to do so without asking questions. Sometimes what I was ordered to do didn't make any sense. For example, why was I told to take a train from Spokane, Washington to North Carolina when I was going to be shipped out from Oakland, California to the Philippine Islands? And then he wrote, I didn't always agree with what I was told to do, but I did it anyway. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And I can understand spending four years in the army that you listen to your commanding officers. You want to make sure you were not displeasing to them. As Christians, we have a commanding officer. That commanding officer is Jesus. Our commanding officer always gives us commands that not only make sense, but are correct. I may not always understand everything God asks me to do, but I believe that he is always correct, always right. So I cheerfully try to obey his commands. You know, to be at AWOL, absent without leave in the military, can be a serious matter. More than a few have been court-martialed for going AWOL. It is also a serious matter for those of us who are soldiers for Christ to be AWOL when we should be on active duty for our Lord. I want you to think on that. You see, as a soldier in the Lord's army, we need to remember that the Christian life involves a battle. The Bible des describes disciples of Christ as soldiers. But it also pictures the Christian in a battle or a fight. Several times Paul told Timothy to fight the good fight. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight. And in chapter 6, he says, fight the good fight of the faith. And in 2 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy that he should face Paul's death with peace and confidence because Paul has fought the good fight. He says, I fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Now understand, Paul is not talking about church fights. Our fellow Christians are not our enemies. Yes, they can be used by the enemy, 
However, our foe is the one Peter describes as a roaring lion in 1 Peter 5. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You see, our enemy is the devil, also known as Satan. As soldiers in the Lord's army who are in a battle, we are to seek recruits for the Lord's army. Every Christian has been commissioned as a, an enlistment officer in the army. That's not a, to just a few, but to all of us. We are not promised any monetary reward for each person we recruit. But we are promised that if we lead people to faith in God, we will shine like the stars forever and ever. We read in Daniel chapter 3, those who have insight will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So, okay, we are soldiers in God's army. We are in a spiritual battle. We are expected to seek out recruits for his army. But understand, we are not left unprotected. We have an offensive weapon. Our weapons are not rifles or handguns or bombs or anything like that. In 2 Corinthians, Paul tells us that we do live in the world, but we do not fight in the same way the world fights. We fight with weapons that are different from those the world uses. Our weapons have power from God that can destroy the enemy's strong places. We destroy people's arguments and every proud thing that raises itself against the knowledge of God. We capture every thought and make it give up and obey Christ. And it is in Paul's letter to the Ephesians that we learn that we have really only one offensive weapon. It is mentioned in his description of our spiritual armor. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Our primary weapon is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. We have a mandate to help conform our society to the standards of right and wrong as outlined in the Bible. God's way is for us to capture the minds of those who have been controlled by the lies of Satan and bring them under the control of the one who is the commander-in-chief of the entire universe, the one who created them and loves them, the one who died for them. We do this best by presenting in a pleasant and loving way the truths and claims of the gospel. So, people will volunteer to leave the forces of Satan and enlist in the Lord's army. So, as a Christian, you are a soldier in the Lord's army. Back in 1979, I enlisted in the U.S. Army, and I spent four years in the army. And during those four years, I had my eye on the date that I would finish and go on with my life. Back in 1977, I enlisted in a different army. I enlisted in the Lord's Army. And you know what? I have been keeping my eye on the time when I'd be leaving my post here and enter into eternal life. Yes, I know there's a difference. My responsibilities in the U.S. Army are not the same as my responsibility in the Lord's Army. But there is one difference that I think falls into the so what category. My enlistment in the army was for a limited time. My enlistment in the Lord's army is for life. It doesn't end. We don't retire. We are to serve the King of kings and Lord of lords for life. Here's my point. When we face Christ on judgment day, are you going to hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant? Well done, my good and faithful soldier? Or will we hear, why did you give up so soon? As a Christian, as a brother or sister in Christ, as a disciple of Christ, a student, 
as a friend of the King of Kings, as a resident alien of earth, because you are a citizen of heaven, as a soldier of the Lord, how are you living out your life in the here and now? Do you strive to please your commanding officer, Jesus Christ? Are you staying in the battle or have you gone AWOL? Have you shared your faith with others striving to enlist them into a life with Christ? Or do you want to leave them in a life of loss? Are you daily using, getting familiar with the sword of your spirit? Your only offensive weapon, the word of God. These are the things we do because of the new life in Christ we have received. It's been a few years since we sang Onward Christian Soldiers, and I guess that song is falling out of pop popularity over the years. The military picture paints it not as a picture some people want to see. But we are soldiers, but not the kind the world views. We follow Jesus with the view of sacrifice, the view of love, with the view of service. So we go back to the so what. Are you part of the Lord's army? Are you still serving? Or are you waiting for an, a, best, a better enlistment bonus? Or are you AWOL? For you see, when it comes to this spiritual battle that's going on around us, there are no bystanders. Well, in the words of Bob Dylan, you've got to serve somebody. In a moment, we're going to be singing Onward Christian Soldiers. And as we do, I want you to decide which side of the battle you're going to be. Who are you going to serve? In a moment, we're going to sing that old hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. Listen to the words. Onward Christian Soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe. Forward into battle, see his banner go. This is not going into battle like the world says going into battle. Going into a spiritual battle. Fighting Satan. Wearing the armor that God has given us. Carrying the sword of the spirit. God's word. Going into battle, changing lives. Are you prepared? Choose today to follow the commander of the Lord's army. Let's sing. Onward, Christian soldiers. Let's close in prayer. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for enlisting us into your army. Thank you for getting us out of Satan's battle group. But Father, there may be some listening to this sermon who do not know you, who have not listed, have been hanging on on the outside of the recruitment center. Father, I just pray your heart will touch them. And they may come to say, yes, I want to. I want to be yours. For for those of us who have enlisted, Father, help us not to go AWOL. Help us to strive each day to serve you, to honor you, to obey you. To live our lives for you. Father, we want to do what we can to please you. Be with us this week. Help us to strive to be an example for you in your kingdom. Father, we thank you in your son's holy and precious name. Amen.
Thank you.